Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, we're about to start uh, this press conference. And uh, over to you, Minister. Thanks, Ethan. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Today, I'm pleased to be able to join you to provide an overview of two actions Alberta has taken in order to assert our constitutional jurisdiction and protect firearms owners from an increasingly hostile federal government. Now, first, I'd like to go over the actions that have led to today's announcement. First, in 2020, the federal government issued a ban on more than 1,500 models of firearms. Then, in October of this year, the federal government implemented what they characterize as a, quote, freeze on the transfer of handguns, end quote, an action that bans new handgun ownership. And then third, a month later, at the last minute, the federal government tabled amendments to Bill C-21 that ban shotguns, rifles used by hunters, farmers, and target shooters. Now, taken all together, these actions will criminalize hundreds of thousands of Canadians overnight, the majority of which reside in Western Canada. And it's becoming increasingly clear that the federal Liberal government is pursuing a strategy to ban all legal firearms ownership. The federal Liberals scared Canadians by describing some firearms as their terminology was, quote, assault style, end quote, even though they knew that the only difference between these firearms and conventional rifles and shotguns is the styling. They also told Canadians repeatedly that these measures were not targeting law-abiding hunters and farmers. And this lie was laid bare by the amendments to C-21. At the very same time, Minister Medicino and his government have failed to take action against the importation and smuggling of illegal firearms from the United States. Their actions are targeting Western Canadians for a reason. This is about shoring up their own political support. To do so, they seek to divide us. Western Canadians versus Eastern Canadians, rural Canadians versus urban Canadians. And Albertans have had enough. So today, we are taking action. First, as Alberta's Attorney General, I have directed that the Alberta Crown Prosecution Service take over the handling of charges involving the Firearms Act starting January 1st, 2023. Currently, the federal government handles cases involving the Federal Firearms Act. Provinces have the constitutional jurisdiction to handle federal criminal law charges, including charges under the Firearms Act. Alberta's Crown Prosecution Service already has the expertise to take on this work, and any further resources will be provided. I've sent a letter to the Federal Minister of Justice as of this morning, advising him that Alberta is taking this jurisdiction back. Alberta's Crown Prosecutors will now determine whether or not to pursue charges under the Firearms Act, not federal government lawyers. And second, a new protocol has been issued to Crown Prosecutors, which outlines how to handle charges related to the federal firearms ban. While respecting the operational independence on individual cases, the new protocol provides prosecutors with guidance on evaluating the public interest on whether or not to pursue charges. The protocol states that it will not be in the public interest to proceed with the prosecution of a charge of a possession of a banned firearm where the following factors exist. First, that the accused lawfully obtained the firearm or prohibited device before May 1st, 2020. Second, that the firearm or prohibited device was reclassified as prohibited on May 1st, 2020. And then third, the accused has not been charged with any other offense in relation to the possession or use of that firearm. Now, right now, there is an amnesty in place that allows the federal government's amnesty that allows firearms owners to possess firearms they purchased before the ban was in place. And this amnesty period ends October 30th, 2023. Just like with the implementation of the long gun registry, we believe that the federal government will extend this amnesty period further as it becomes clear to the public and to the media that Public Safety Canada does not have the capacity, the wherewithal, or the resources to confiscate hundreds of thousands of firearms across Canada. However, that does not mean that they are willing to take any risks. If the federal government does not extend the amnesty, 
or a story that we are willing to take any risks. If the federal government does not extend the amnesty, any person that owns a firearm listed in the 2020 ban will be criminalized by the federal government in October of 2023. That's less than a year from now and why we have to take action now. Further, over the past month, we have seen the federal government go even further than we could have imagined with the proposed amendments to Bill C-21. These amendments ban hundreds of new models of legally owned shotguns and rifles. These actions clearly target hunters, they clearly target farmers, and they are clearly target sports shooters who collectively own hundreds of thousands of firearms that could soon be prohibited. If these amendments are successful, Bill C-21 will be the most sweeping and arbitrary ban in Canadian history. The ban will not only be unenforceable, but it will criminalize hundreds of thousands of Canadians. And if that happens, we will consider extending this protocol to cover the firearms targeted under the amendments proposed to Bill C-21. Thank you for your time today. I'll now turn things over to Chief Firearms Officer Bryant for her remarks. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Minister, honoured members of the press, ladies and gentlemen. Since my appointment, I have viewed all firearms issues through a public safety lens. Ensuring Albertans continue to enjoy a safe, orderly and respectful society requires all participants in the legislative, regulatory, law enforcement and judicial processes to keep focused on what really matters. The precious resources taxpayers entrust to us are not unlimited and we must direct them to where they will do the most good. This means rejecting measures that are founded on sensationalistic calls for restrictions that are costly, ineffective, and lacking in any evidentiary basis. Albertans and other Canadians want problems solved, not used as wedge issues to divide us for narrow partisan political purposes. I have consulted widely with user groups, other concerned citizens, provincial and federal lawmakers and law enforcement at all levels and found very solid support for this approach, with one notable exception. Unfortunately, our current federal government continues to double down on failed approaches that would squander vast resources and criminalize some of the most law-abiding citizens in our country. I have been increasingly disturbed to see our federal government ignore calls to redirect its attention to the real issues of smuggling and illegal arms trafficking and instead broaden its attacks to include ever more hunters, ranchers, sports shooters, indigenous peoples, collectors preserving historical artifacts and other law-abiding Canadians. I am heartened to see that our provincial government recognizes the inherently flawed nature of the federal approach and is doing everything in its power to protect the law-abiding from federal overreach. The law-abiding firearms community has a long track record of gladly complying with reasonable measures to ensure public safety. They willingly accept the need for some restrictions on their activities to protect our society from those who would do us harm. But the measures our federal government is currently proposing fail the tests of fairness, reasonableness, and effectiveness. I see today's announcement as welcome recognition of the need to protect Albertans from becoming collateral damage in the federal government's draconian campaign against firearms ownership by carefully vetted and trained Canadians of all backgrounds. Thank you. Thank you, CFO Bryant. We'll now enter the question portion. Uh, one question and one follow-up per. Uh, please state the name and uh, organization you represent. So we'll start with anyone here in the room. To, uh, just to uh, elaborate on some of the remarks you made in your opening remarks, um, you said this is a very political bill uh, by the feds to seeking to divide and conquer regions. I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. Can you elaborate on that? What's what's being what's happening here? Well, I would say that originally when Bill C-21 was proposed, they had this fig leaf that they were trying to claim that this had nothing to do with targeting hunters or uh, farmers or sports shooters. And I think we've seen that uh, fig leaf being taken away with these proposed amendments. This is uh, very political. This is not about uh, targeting safety. This is not about targeting reducing gun crime. 
They're proposing to remove mandatory minimums for a variety of offenses, including weapons trafficking. They are failing to uh, do anything about the illegal smuggling of firearms across the, the border. If this is about keeping our community safe, there are a lot more reasonable measures that need to be taken before or uh, in, instead of the, the proposed um, ban on firearms that are included in the, the OIC, but also in C21 and those most recent proposed amendments. I'm sorry, but you were saying, if I, if I heard you correctly, that they were pitting regions against other regions. What, what do you mean by that? Most of these firearms owners that will be criminalized overnight with these proposed amendments are in Western Canada, and many of them, if not most of them, are in rural Alberta. So this is about pitting and uh, one, one faction or, not, or one group of the, the country against the other, and by scaring people. I think we have to remember the rhetoric that the federal government is using by, by inventing terms like assault style or military style to describe firearms that are mechanically no different than uh, conventional rifles and shotguns shows that they are trying to use this um, as a wedge to divide Canadians. Uh, Arthur Green, Western Standard. Um, Minister, do you believe this is the federal government uh, trying to disarm Canadians? Well, they're trying to remove legal firearms ownership and they're targeting Canadians who have lawfully obtained, purchased their firearms rather than working on measures that would improve safety in our communities. Um, just a follow-up. So the SKS, I don't know if you're familiar with the SKS uh, rifle, but it's a... Ethan is. It's a, a, an out-of-date semi-auto rifle that can normally be bought at surplus. It originally held 10 cartridges, but now it's been pinned to hold five. Um, you know, this rifle has been used as a hunting rifle since the 1950s, and now it's deemed a useless gun for the military with the caliber of only a 7.62 by 39. And it's comparable to the 308, which is now being banned. But, like, I, I don't understand how they're classifying which rifles to ban when they've been used for hunting for, for so many years. But I think the point is that there, there is no thought behind the decisions to be made with these proposed amendments. And this isn't about safety. It's not even this, this fig leaf that they originally were trying to hold up about it being assault style and, and trying to scare Canadians because there was a firearm that looked scary. I mean, the SKS doesn't even look scary, obviously. Um, obviously, is isn't military style, um, and uh, it's, it's not going to be a firearm that is going to be included uh, for what uh, a country would be providing to its uh, military, um, or even shotguns. Shotguns that, that might have six or more cartridges in them. Um, uh, if they are uh, semi-automatic. I mean, these are the types of, of firearms that would become illegal, that are used by sport shooters, by hunters, by farmers, and, um, and there is no thought behind where they're drawing these lines. Is there, um, you, you said that um, you were directing your Crown prosecutors to take over the handling of charges under the Firearms Act. Aren't the majority of charges already handled by provincial Crown prosecutors? So right now, Firearms uh, Act charges are being handled by federal government lawyers. So this is the, the provincial government advising the federal government that we are going to have the ACPS, the Alberta Crown Prosecution Service, to be taking over these, um, the handling of these prosecutions. All, federal, like all of them are being handled by federal lawyers? If it's the Firearms Act, currently, yes. Okay, thanks. Um, I have some questions on, on the protocol and the distinction between law-abiding and, and violent. Um, so let's say it's a non-violent drug offense, like drug trafficking, but there is possession. Uh, those firearms could be seized, but um, if it's like, say, a landowner using, using their gun for like a war warning shot or something, but doesn't actually hit anyone, they could be charged. Like, can you just explain what this violent... The new, new pro protocol? The protocol, you're like what, what does it mean for violent offenses and when, when is it expected to be enforced? So first of all, there are uh, many different guidelines that are provided. We, we actually recently, as recently as this summer in, in June, updated the, uh, the manual for the Crown Prosecutors. So this is something that is often updated. Um, that was a campaign commitment for us to update the, the Crown Prosecutor's Manual. There are many different guidelines. There are a dozen of protocols, and they will deal with a variety of issues like hate crimes 
or self-defense, and they will try to provide advice to um, the, the Crown Prosecution Service regarding what is or may not be in, in the public interest. The discretion to prosecute is still within the, the, the prosecutors, um, uh, but what this protocol is, is proposing is giving advice that if there are four fa or three factors that are met, first, that, that uh, the uh, accused lawfully obtained the firearm in, involved in this charge, um, or, or prohibited advice was um, obtained before May 1st of 2020. So this is about the OIC from May 1st, 2020. The second, that it that device related to this charge was reclassified in that OIC of May 1st, 2020. And then third, that the accused has not been charged with any other offense in relation to the possession or the use of that firearm. So the hypotheticals I think you're um, asking about would be addressed by that third factor. And, and you had mentioned that this is about the Liberals shoring up their support politically. How, how is this not a political move on your part? I think this is about us focusing on a response to something that would um, result in hundreds of thousands of Canadians being criminalized overnight. And instead of addressing gun crime in our communities, targeting lawfully uh, or law-abiding Canadians who have legally obtained their firearms, and our focus for the last three and a half years has been on um, making our community safe. We've seen a reduction in, in, the, um, in Alberta, at least. I know that the, the numbers nationally have increased, the number of homicides that relate to, uh, to firearms. But because we will continue to focus on keeping our community safe with thoughtful uh, policies and uh, initiatives to reduce gun crime in our communities, and we invite the federal government to do the same. Assuming that this is no one else is doing this. Did, right did you get a follow-up? Is that was that your follow-up? I just be, before she's interrupted. <laughs> no, 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 no follow-up. Okay. Cat, Cat had two, but I suspect she has another. Okay, I just want to make sure she wasn't interrupted. Okay, okay. I defer to Cat. Oh no, 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 go ahead. I just looking for some context, Minister. I assume we're the first province to do this uh, on in relation to C21. Have you talked to your other other justice ministers or other provinces doing this or are contemplating it? Well, we have talked to um, uh, Manitoba. Well, actually, we've, we've talked to, to all the provinces. As of the, the last FPT, um, the, the National Conference or Convention of Justice and Public Safety Ministers that occurred in, in October, um, and um, we um, were able to reiterate to the federal government our concerns, um, not just about the confiscation plan, and, and we're not the only province to have these concerns. We are talking to other provinces on how we can coordinate uh, together on our responses to uh, to what's being proposed by the federal government, but also to point out that there have been a number of initiatives from the federal government over the last few years that have made our communities less safe. And we, we highlighted to Minister uh, Lametti that the amendments to the bail regime in C-75 uh, in 2019 have resulted, it's not just Alberta who's, who's pointing out that this is making our communities less safe. Um, you know, we should all be presumed innocent until proven guilty, but there are a lot of situations where uh, pretrial custody is uh, more appropriate, especially for repeat offenders. Um, and I think it was helpful that we were able to, as, uh, as, as one voice, as many different provinces, to bring that forward. So I, those are examples of the ways in which we do work together to reiterate those concerns of the federal government. So we are breaking ground here. Alberta's the first, though, <coughs> in terms of this particular. Yes, this, this is the first. Minister, are you anticipating any pushback from Ottawa? From I know you sent the letter, but but have they responded at all? Like, is there going to be a... They haven't sent, this has been sent uh, today. We have not received uh, an, an answer yet from Minister Lametti, but we have to remember that the administration of justice is um, had a power that falls to the provinces under the Constitution. When we talk about constitutionality, is, like, I know this is a little bit down the road, but is this something where Bill 1, like the Sovereignty Act, would come into play at a later date if this goes down the road? Well, this isn't related to the Sovereignty Act at all. Correct. But I mean, yeah. In the future, if yeah. we're talking about constitutional. Yeah, just to preface the, the, my answer with that, um, but this is within the power that, that the Attorney General has. Um, if there are ways in which um, there are further steps that the province needs to take to, um, to address the concerns we have with the confiscation uh, program, um, all options are on the table, as I've said before. You mentioned those three parameters earlier. What situation do you think a gun owner would be in where Alberta wouldn't prosecute charges? Well, if it meets those three factors. Anything specifically that, any situation specifically that you see? 
if it would meet these three factors, if somebody is charged with a firearm and it was a firearm that was um, already obtained before that, the date of the OIC and was reclassified as a result of the OIC and there were no other charges related. So um, uh, I, mean, I, I leave it for other folks to, to fill in the blanks for, for hypotheticals. And are you, I mean, on, on that, are you afraid that these guns are registered and the federal government may actually come to get them? Is that something you're looking at? Well, it's what they're proposing. Um, and, and I think they're hoping that the amnesty less than a year from now is going to be long enough time for, for folks to um, be able to comply. Uh, but it's not. They don't have a plan. They've started in, in PEI, and they're making their way west. And I think it's obvious that this is a, a billion-dollar boondoggle that has no resources from Public Safety Canada to be able to execute on it. Would you expect the um, other provinces to follow Alberta's lead? And uh, have you spoken to the Northwest Territories about this issue as well? I, you know, I have not spoken to the Northwest Territories specifically about what's being announced today. Um, so what was the first part of your question, though? Has, like, do you expect the other provinces to follow suit? So to take where Alberta's taking the lead, do you expect Saskatchewan, Manitoba? Uh, perhaps I'll leave that for them. Perhaps to, to, to answer. Um, there are also ways in which other provinces, like Saskatchewan, have also stepped up to uh, to address their concerns, like firearms uh, legislation in Saskatchewan, um, which we've uh, been interested in following and looking at and analyzing. Um, so, it, and I think Premier has discussed that uh, publicly, that there may be an opportunity for Alberta to consider similar legislation here in Alberta. We're now gonna go to the lines. Uh, operator, can you put through the first caller? Julian LaTraverse, Radio Canada. Hi, thank you. My question is for uh, Madame Bryant. So, d'après vous, pourquoi il était important de mettre ce protocol en place Merci pour la question. Euh, je pense qu'il a été important d'introduire euh, ce protocole maintenant parce que euh, le gouvernement fédéral euh, se, prépare, se prépare pour euh, lancer une campagne pour, euh, pour racheter ces armes à feu et euh, donc... Euh, euh, l'échéance de l'amnistie la, euh, s'approche et euh, après l'échéance de l'amnistie, euh, les honnêtes citoyens respectueux de la loi euh, puissent euh, faire euh, face à des conséquences légales euh, et euh, je crois qu'il vaut mieux éviter euh, cette situation. Do you have a follow-up? Oui, thank you. Je me demandais aussi, d'après vous, ça sera quoi la réaction du fédéral euh, par rapport là, au, pro au protocole que vous mettez en place aujourd'hui? Euh, je ne suis pas euh, avocate et alors euh, je ne peux pas euh, analyser euh, cette question euh, du point de vue légal, mais euh, je suis presque certain que Uh, uh, les ministres du fédéral ne seront pas très heureux. Uh, thank you. Uh, are there any more questions in the room? Mr. Can I ask you something on, <coughs> excuse me, on, <coughs> on my voice, something on Bill 1. Um, it's supposed to give royal assent this week, do you know? And does it take legal effect upon when this proclamation is it? When royal assent is, or what's the process? Um, so what I've been told by House Leader is is that uh, they are expecting to meet with the Lieutenant Governor today, and I think they're expecting royal assent today. And I, th I think proclamation is is uh, at that time. So it takes legal effect today. I, that, that's my understanding. If 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 what I've been told by the House Leader, that, that may be a question for the House Leader. If, um, but that's what I've been advised. Would there, would there have been some benefit to? Uh, I mean, you were, you're going within the constitutional rules on this. Announcement today. I mean, why not wait a couple days and boom, you've got Bill One at your disposal, and you could bring something to the House and, and make even more sweeping uh, challenge to, to what, C21. And th this isn't related to. This doesn't require the Sovereignty Act. Um, there will be ways in which we and, and other ministries analyze opportunities that the Sovereignty Act might be used. Um, so we are looking at that. As I said, we're also looking at 
whether we proceed, uh, as, as Premier has announced, looking at whether we need um, provincial legislation related to firearms, like Saskatchewan is proposing to do. Um, so there, there are a lot of opportunities for us to take a look at uh, in the, uh, the coming days. Have you been asked by the Premier then to perhaps look at ways to challenge the feds on this using the Sovereignty Act? Well, she's, she's um, in, invited um, ministers to, to look at ways within their own departments um, for, for that to, to be the case. So it's, it's been an invitation to all members of Executive Council. Do, do you have any idea, like, what... I, I know you're still determining whether there needs to be additional resources to the Crown Prosecution Service, but do you have any idea of the type of volume that the federal prosecutors have been dealing with under the Firearms Act offences? Uh, that's a good question. We can get back to you on that. We'll, we'll find out what the, the volume for the last couple of years has been for federal prosecutors. We'll, we'll get that to you so you can have a, a sense of the volume that'll be going to the, the provincial crown. I'm sure part of this, um, I mean, it, I, mean I, I guess the term comes to mind, it's a bit, it's a bit of a political theater on your part as well, as well as the federal government. So what happens if the federal government just ignores you and just doesn't say anything or do anything to this? Because obviously, it seems that you want to provoke some kind of response from the federal government, right? No, response isn't needed. It's it's our under our head of power in the constitution. So this is our constitutional jurisdiction. It, this is a choice that we get to make. It's not a, a negotiation with the federal government. So there's there's no response that's needed. We advise them that this is our decision, um, and then uh, within the court, pro court processes, this will be uh, issues that are, are dealt with instead of by federal government lawyers by the ACPS. You're not trying to pick a fight here. There's, there's no fight to be had because there's no negotiation with the federal government over this issue. That, that's why I, I, I disagree with your premise that this is theater on our part. This is within our jurisdiction as a province. We see the need, as I made clear in my remarks at the beginning, that there's a need for us to, to take over this jurisdiction, for us to be able to uh, issue the protocols that could provide guidance on when it will and won't be in the, the public interest. This isn't precedent setting in terms of like other provinces have exercised this authority. Have they not in, in other circumstances? I'm thinking BC maybe on, on how it prosecutes. It provinces and, and because uh, as I said, they, the administration of, of justice is within their, their jurisdiction. So provinces make various decisions about when and when not they might have matters going to, to their own prosecution services in their province and when they might want to defer it to, to be dealt with by the federal. This is the first time a province has said, you know what, this is, no. we're going to ask our own prosecutors to handle this as no. opposed to the feds, right? No, I, I, my understanding, this is not, not the first time that a province has said this, no. You know, when else would they have stepped in to do that? Like, we can get that answer for you. Yeah. We'll, we'll, okay. we'll look into that. Is this that, is that what the whole BC drug thing was about? Was, was uh, the feds finally said, okay, we don't, you know, there was... No, that was a decriminalization uh, for the, the province. Um, and, and I know that the federal government, though, when it comes to... Um, uh, when it does come to certain drug crimes, uh, it, 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 they have issued protocols to their own uh, federal government lawyers um, to, to when and when not to, to prosecute, but... Um, that, that was, that's a separate issue and what happened there with the decriminalization of BC. Um, just one last question, Minister, and it's uh, just to follow up on that. Uh, does the province uh, support the decriminalization of drugs here in Edmonton? It, well, first of all, so that's a complicated question. Maybe that's better suited to Minister Milliken. Um, here's my take. I think if our country is having conversations about the decriminalization of, of, um, um, of drugs, um, we have to think about what, what the purpose would be behind that. Um, I think if we look at the number of people who um, had passed from an overdose of an opioid over the last five years, it's a very small number of folks who would have been uh, incarcerated for simple possession um, you know, before they, they had passed from an overdose. So this isn't about reducing um, deaths. We have to focus on what's going to... Um, uh, help reduce the number of deaths from opioids. I think that our focus on recovery and developing a recovery-oriented system of care in Alberta has been the reason why we've seen a reduction here in, in Alberta. Um, I think that we would also need to make sure that there are, there are systems in place within a province to be able to deal with um, uh, drug use and, um, and, and before there was decriminalization. And I think what's happened in BC by having decriminalization first is, is going to 
lead to unsafe situations. But I'll, I'll leave it to Minister Milliken to, to further answer that. That's my hot take, though. Uh, your letter to Minister Lametti was very brief, and it did not mention um, directing resources to stopping arms smuggling over the border. I'm wondering what, if any, conversations have you had with him about directing those resources? Well, not, uh, not with Mr. Lametti, because he's the Minister of Justice, uh, but with Minister Medicino I have. Uh, many times, and we most recently spoke about it, uh, not just Alberta, but Ontario. Um, Minister Kersner from Ontario, he's the Solicitor General there, um, brought forward to Minister Mendicino the concerns that he had. I mean, there are, are drones that are coming across the border to Sarnia uh, that um, are getting caught up in trees. And so he, he was bringing up anecdotal evidence that, that was a concern for him on how drugs are being smuggled across the border in Ontario. Um, there's a big border between Ontario and the United States. Um, so uh, all the provinces have had concerns with what's, what hasn't been done to that uh, extent. I think the CBSA do a great job when it comes to our, our ports of entry. The hard part is what happens between those ports of entry. And, and there's no clarity from the federal government whose jurisdiction it is. And the federal government has to step up and, and assign it to somebody. Someone, someone has to have that responsibility. And then somebody has to be given the resources to start protecting our borders from illegal gun smuggling. Do the Crown prosecutors have any concerns with like additional work being placed upon them? Have you heard anything about that? Well, I mean, we, we did work when I came into this role in February, we did work with them to um, have a plan to <laughs> filling vacancies, to uh, creating new positions within the Crown Prosecution Service. Um, we developed a framework for them so that the, the good relationship they currently have with government doesn't have to always ebb and flow and depend on, on who a, a minister or a government might be. So I think they, they describe this new framework so that they have an ability to bring concerns about resources um, to government's attention. Um, I think they've uh, lauded us for having uh, developed that with them. And I think they said this is the, the, the best relationship that the, the association has had with government in their 50 year history. But in this particular announcement, they're not concerned about that adding undue burden to the workload. Well, I, I think if, if I look, I'm not going to speak for Dallas, but I think if he were up here at the, the podium uh, with me, I think he would say that the important part for him from the announcement today is, is our commitment to re re increasing resources as needed. Um, we will take one last question from the lines. Operator, can you put the caller through? Thank you, Aaron Collins, CBC National. Well, thanks for taking my question. Um, I just wanted you to acknowledge the, the independence of, of Crown prosecutors. I'm just curious how this protocol, which is essentially direct prosecutors not to no. prosecute or to enforce a federal law, no. how that doesn't undermine that independence. No, this is uh, different. And as I, I said even earlier to another question, that we have a Crown, prosecutor, uh, sorry, Crown Prosecutor's Manual uh, that provides advice uh, there is no direction to prosecutors in these matters. There's advice uh, through guidelines, through protocols. There's dozens of protocols that provides advice to our Crown prosecutors. There is no direction, and there should be no direction. There should be no political intervention in uh, prosecution decisions. Um, that is left to our prosecutors. That's an important part of our democracy. Um, it's a, I would say it's, it's part of our unwritten constitution that was... Um, articulated by Lord Shawcross, as he later became. Uh, and uh, it's very important for those decisions to, to be free of uh, political interference. But what we often do uh, within the office of the Attorney General is to develop protocols to provide guidance for how those decisions are made for, by uh, the prosecutors. Do you have a follow-up? Yeah, uh, I do. So let, let's, let me run a hypothetical by you. Let's fast forward a few months and uh, um, let's imagine that you do decide to use Bill 1 uh, to deem C-21 is unconstitutional. Would you be able, under that legislation, the way you read it, to direct prosecutors not to enforce a federal law? I mean, that's essentially what the Sovereignty Act is about, right? So uh, would you be able to do that in your mind? And how, how does that not go against everything you just said to me? No, no prosecutor should be directed, no prosecution or decision about a prosecution should be directed by any politician. That's an important part of our democracy, as I said. I, I would just reiterate the, the answer I gave to your previous question. 
Okay, thank you, everyone.